Thanks, Karen. I think I'll stay over on this side. Uh, I'd like to start uh, doing a little bit of a little more background in history because um, I do, uh, it, it, like a lot of attorneys, uh, start out their practice doing a lot of different things, and I gravitated during thing, doing things that I'd like to do. In 1999, I decided I did not like the fighting that most attorneys did, you know, suing and, and uh, in the litigation side. So, and uh, I did enjoy the estate planning uh, and uh, the consulting side of that. So, uh, because what, what I very much enjoy is having my clients actually be happier after they leave my office than when they came in. Most attorneys can't say that. So, so since 1999, we've been, our firm has been exclusively doing what we call happy law. And, uh, you know, because our clients are happier. And even after a death or disability, they're comforted knowing that things are gonna be handled properly and promptly. So we do happy law, and uh, in fact, that's our website, happylaw.com. We've even trademarked happy law at the US Patent and Trademark Office. So. Um, all of the articles that I have written is, are on the website, so uh, anything that we're going to be talking about, most of the information that we're going to be talking about is on the website. Um, let's see, where is, there it is, okay. Um, if you have, uh, follow along, if you have, uh, if you have some of the uh, information, uh, we're going to have some, there's some, pretty detailed case studies that we have. We're not going to have time to go through them in detail, but they are on the Leave a Legacy website, so you can print them out both in an outline format. These are examples. They're simplified examples. <laughs> they may not look simple, but they give you some ideas uh, to, to work with. Um, the thing is, what the focus today that I'm going to be talking about is, um, is what happens when a contributor ends up in a nursing home. Because typically, what many of the um, the uh, the people that are actually at the home uh, that are advising people um, on payment of their their uh, nursing home fees and qualification for Medicaid only know the general rules. And the general rules are: you probably heard me have to spend down your assets. You only can have two thousand dollars and a few other things like that. Um, and that's that's what these people are told. And the thing is, is that there's a whole lot of other options out there. Um, so if they, if they don't seek advice from others, then they end up just spending all their money on the nursing home, and then who is really out? You know, the, their, some of their favorite charities, their family, and other loved ones. So they have to spend it all down. They apply for Medicaid to pay for their nursing home care. They have no more assets to make contributions to support their passions and their favorite charities, and the charities no longer then have that source of income. With proper planning, the contributors can provide for their favorite charities and their loved ones and still qualify for Medicaid. Okay. 
one of the things, most information that you probably, that uh, your donors are going to be hearing are, are well-intentioned, but only partly true. You know, like that, spend down your assets to the $2,000. Um, I'm going to do a little exercise. Uh, can everybody put their hands up like this? Okay, go like this. You hey, know, shake it. Okay, that's your Etch-a-Sketch. You've just erased what you probably heard about Medicaid and Medicaid qualification, so we're starting from a blank slate. Okay, uh, Medicaid rules are very complex. Uh, I mean, I did, t I did tax work for a long time, and the Medicaid rules are every bit as complex with the rules, regulations. There's both federal regulations, there's state regulations. Uh, they're very complex. Um, and to, to yeah, there's no like quick fix or easy way. Um, we see it all the time. People will try to do do-it-yourself plans. If you're dealing with someone or a donor that's in that situation, encourage them to seek competent legal advice. Um, and my goal here today is for you to issue spot so that you know what those issues are so that you can direct your donors in the proper direction. So we're going to cover some of the misconceptions and truth. I don't need Medicaid because I have Medicare. Okay? Um, well, Medicare is basically health insurance for people 65 and over or people who are under 65 who are disabled. Um, so Medicare is generally the four parts, parts A, B, C, and D. Um, and uh, it'll take care of, you know, A is hospitalization, rehab after, um, after uh, a hospital stay. Um, B is general office visits, uh, durable medical equipment, a few other things. C is the private insurance equivalent of A and B, and then D is the prescription drug plan. Now Medicaid, on the other hand, is medical care for people who cannot afford their own medical care. So it's basically, uh, it is a uh, assistance program. Uh, for seniors, and this is where we, we uh, get involved, and even if they're not a senior and they require a nursing home, because we've had a number of individuals who are younger than 65, we still qualify them for Medicaid, but it will pay for nursing home care. Medicaid, or Medicaid will cover those costs if you are financially qualified. However, Medicare will not cover custodial care in a skilled nursing facility. They will pay for rehab up to 100 days after a, you know, a three-night hospital stay, but not long-term custodial care, but Medicaid will. So some people say, well, I'm just going to put my kids' names on, the, on these assets that are protected for Medicaid. Well, that's still a old hangout from the, uh, or a holdout from the Michigan inheritance tax, which went away 20 years ago. Uh, you could put people's joint, jointly on your assets and it's not going to be taxed. But it doesn't matter if somebody's name is on an asset. It is their asset, either 100% or a percentage, depending upon the asset, that is included in um, their what is called an asset group for Medicaid. Okay? For single individuals, anything with their name on it. And what a lot of married couples don't know is that it doesn't matter whose name is on the asset. Husband or wife, or husband, husband, wife, wife. It doesn't matter. Both spouses' assets are, are considered one asset group. And a lot of people don't realize this, especially with second marriages. In fact, I'm going through one right now where wife was fairly wealthy, uh, husband, first husband and left her a, you know, a nice trust to take care of things. And then now her second husband is in a nursing home and she doesn't want to use her money to take care of him. So we're working on that right now because she says, I'm going to divorce him before I'm going to use any of my money for him. The thing is, is that unfortunately in this particular situation, that, that may be an option. But you know, if she really does not want to use her money 
to spend for his care. Well, doesn't he get 50%? <laughs> You'll see. We'll go through that. Yeah, that's one of the misconceptions. Yes. Yes. Thank you. That's a good segue. We'll cover that. That's one of the misconceptions. Okay. Um, if I give my assets away, I have to wait 60 months to apply and, uh, and apply and qualify for Medicaid. Not true. You can make a gift today, and we do this all the time, and qualify for Medicaid tomorrow, especially when you're gifting to spouses. There is no disqualification or penalty. There are unlimited gifting to spouses. So if you give them properly to the spouses and convert an basically an asset into an income stream as, we, as we're going to cover in one of our case studies, you can give substantial gifts to spouses. And that's one of the things that, um, that we're going to talk about in order to protect income streams for the charities, you can basically shift virtually all the marital assets to a spouse and then after the first year they are now, once one, the, the nursing home spouse is qualified for Medicaid, it's then split after the first year and they're considered two separate asset groups. So instead of spending down those assets on a nursing home for the nursing home spouse, you basically can shuttle them over to the well spouse who then after the first year can continue their gifting program to the charity. So it says spending it all down. So, yes. Now, spouses only, yep. Doesn't matter, and we'll, let me see, is it? Yep. Um, yeah, that's a good lead in because that's the very next slide, so thank you. Any gifts that are for more than the fair market value are considered what are called divestments. Under the Medicaid rules of divestments, anything, anything that is, is gifted or a part gift, a part sale, Anything for more than fair market value made within the last 60 months is a divestment. Um, such as paying your grandson $1,000 to mow your lawn. You know, unless you have 40 acres that you have to do, it's probably not going to be a, a, a $1,000. Or bargain sales, we see these, where you sell the family cottage worth $100,000 to your uh, to uh, a child for $60,000. Just a $40,000 gift that's done within the last 60 months, you have to disclose that to the Department of Health and Human Services. In Michigan, uh, the Medicaid program is administered by the State Department of Health and Human Services. Um, it's actually funded both state and federally, but administered by the state. Um, one thing that is, uh, is with the Medicaid rules, it doesn't matter the size of the gift. Now there's, there's uh, different federal rules, but for the state, Department of Health and Human Services, even the $20 donation that you know, pledge people are making to their church every Sunday technically have to be reported. Now we, as practitioners, use a de minimis rule because if we have to report all those small ones, we'd be spending all of our time doing that. So, we generally look at you know, 50 or $100, and then we, we don't report those, and the uh, local, most of the uh, eligibility specialists at the Department of Health and Human Services uh, ignore those too. You know, it's kind of like, ah, you know, <laughs> we don't want um, to know. But the thing is, is that if they are aware of those small donations, they will count them. For example, we had a situation where the, um, they asked for five years of bank statements. And they went through every single check image and any check that they couldn't determine was for you know, something that was like for household expenses of the others, Department of Health and Human Services included as a divestment, even if they were five or ten dollars, or the five hundred dollar um, you know, uh, you know, missionary uh, donation. Those were all considered divestments. And the Department of Health and Human Services can go back, and they will. They have asked uh, for for information for five five years. Um, but 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 there's a lot of things that people don't realize are exempt expenses. 
such as pay review utilities, real estate taxes, other household expenses. So those aren't going to trigger any type of divestments. Buying a new car. A car is an exempt asset. In fact, we just did one we're working on right now where they have two vehicles, a 1962 Corvette convertible and their you know, 2008 Buick. <laughs> Well, the thing is, is that you can have one car. Guess which car we're, we're going to choose to be the exempt car? The 62 vet. <laughs> okay, it's worth about $85,000, but that's going to be the exempt vehicle that we're, that we're going to be using. And then, um, and then the, you know, the 2008 Buick will just be the vehicle that is going to be countable or considered a countable asset. Repairs or improvements to a residence. We had someone that had an extra $50,000. Nursing home said, you have to give us the $50,000. Well, what did, we, what did we do? We worked with them. They already had a prepaid funeral. We couldn't do that. So they finished the basement on the house, spent the $50,000, finished the basement on the house, immediately qualified for Medicaid, didn't spend any of the money for a nursing home. And then after the person passed, they then had a house that had a finished basement. Did they get the whole $50,000 back? No, but the substantial portion of it. Um, prepaid funeral arrangements. Um, we had another situation. Uh, you can, you can uh, limits are up to a little over $12,000, but for families, we've been able to spend on assets without, um, without uh, using that to the nursing home. So you could spend your eight, ten thousand dollars a month in a nursing home, or take a you know a couple of months of it and then buy the prepaid funeral, paying off any debts. Had a situation where a client had um, had uh, seventy-five thousand dollars of cash, and the um, oh it was one hundred and forty, um, one hundred and forty thousand. So in that particular case, each of the spouses were going to get uh, seventy thousand dollars. The nursing home said you have to give us the seventy thousand dollars and pay in monthly, and they had a ninety-five thousand dollar mortgage. So what did we do? We just spent the nursing home spouse's half on the mortgage, paid it down to twenty thousand dollars, and then immediately qualified her for nursing home. So there are things that we can do. Um, payments for services rendered, such as. Legal fees. You can you can pay us to help and assist, and it's not going to create any type of penalty. So when you're working with your donors, you can work with advisors. They can pay their advisors, and it's not going to disqualify them for whatever the planning that they're going to be doing. I can give away fourteen thousand dollars a year. Well, that's the federal gift tax amount without reporting it. And a lot of people think, oh, I can't give you any more than $14,000 a year. Well, that's if you don't want to file Form 709. If you give more than $14,000 to any individual in a year, you have to file a gift tax return. But they don't pay any taxes, as, as most of you know, um, unless their total of those taxable gifts this year is $5.49 million. So they don't realize it. And that most of, at least my clients in Port Huron, are under that. <laughs> okay. Um, now, if, you, if a gift is made, and this is important to think about, is when we're doing planning, especially for single individuals, the divestment is going to be, uh, and this is how we can get some gifts to the charities, is, is thinking about the penalty period. Basically, a gift if it's within the last five years that is a divestment, will create a penalty period. The penalty period is going to be calculated from the date of Medicaid qualification in the nursing home. From that date of Medicaid qualification, they take that total amount of those divestments over the last 60 months, divide that what is called the divestment penalty divisor which is the average nursing home cost in Michigan, which in 2017, they publish it once a year, it's 8,018. Divide the gifts by the 8,018, that's the number of months that they will have a penalty. 
Now this is important because we can create penalties in order to create gifts. You'll see in, uh, in, in one of our examples. But basically, so for example, if somebody had a $10,000 divestment within the last 60 months, divided by the 8,018, that's 1.25 months, so the first 1.25 months of their nursing home stay after Medicaid is approved would be private pay. And then Medicaid will kick in after 1.25 months. So how it works is the penalty doesn't disqualify them for Medicaid. Medicaid is approved, but it's not going to start for a period of time during that divestment penalty period. So if I go into a nursing home, the state will take my assets away. No, the state takes nothing. They just say, we won't pay until you spend them down. And what they are often told is they have to spend it down on the nursing home care. They don't. They can give gifts and still qualify for Medicaid. So if you have, um, um, if you do have those excess assets, they can be spent on the nursing home care or any of the other expenses that we, that we talked about before. So any of these types of things you can spend the money on and it's not going to create a divestment. Okay. Um, if I or my spouse go to a nursing home, I will lose my home. Not true in Michigan, okay? In other states, I understand in Ohio, if someone has been in a nursing home for six months, they have to sell their home. And then the money has to be used to be spent down for nursing home care. Michigan, that is not the case. It's an exempt asset so long as it is titled properly. A lot of people will put kids' names on, do quick claim deeds, and all kinds of things. But if it's in the, in the name of the nursing home resident, it is an exempt asset during their lifetime. And we'll talk about estate recovery afterwards. So, um, because there are ways that you can set up the home and have it actually go to the charity after the death without having to pay back Medicaid. So we have, we have done some of those. So, if you are in a nursing home, what can you keep? Well, they can keep a home that's worth 500, with equity of $560,000 or less. What if the home's worth more? Real easy. Take out a mortgage. Make the equity below 560, and then you got cash to do gifts or do whatever. One automobile, like that 62 Corvette that we're working on right now. Um, prepaid funeral arrangements up to 12380 Burial spaces, life insurance with a cash value of $1,500 or less. Yes? Is that just for the state of Michigan or for the state of It's how our state interprets it. And the, I'm going to, these, these are general federal rules, but each state interprets them a little different. Because technically, it's a $1,500, not cash value, but a $1,500 face value, but Michigan interprets it as cash value. And that's how we've always done it. That's we've done it since 1999. And that's not what the rules say, but the federal rules, but these are. Yeah, what we're talking about is Michigan, and each state's a little different. And then the $2,000 in cash or other assets, that's probably what you've heard. Spend down to $2,000 before they can qualify. These are exempt assets during lifetime, and you can keep them. All the other assets are considered countable assets, and the countable assets are what you're going to use to make the donations. Yes? Yes.
You can, but the thing is, is that if you buy a life insurance policy such as a single premium, it's going to have a cash value if it's a permanent policy. Sure. Term policy, but it's you. I'm, I'm not an in insurance. I've never seen a single premium term policy that has no cash value. I don't know. Maybe there is. Is there such a? Okay, I don't know. But typically, we don't. If if the cash value, and we've done this on a number of situations where the cash value, they wanted to keep the insurance, but the cash value was too high. We just took out a loan on the policy, got the cash value below the 1500 then we had cash to make donations or do whatever. So we just make an accountable asset into an exempt asset. So what about if your spouse is in a nursing home? Well, you can keep all of the assets that we just talked about then the spouse, the well spouse, gets to keep their own income, no matter how much it is. So we've had situations where people have substantial pensions, and these are def these are monthly pensions, not not defined contribution plans where it's a bucket of money. No, the 401ks or IRAs, those are considered countable or available assets. So people who have traditional monthly pensions actually are, are favored in the Medicaid community. So somebody who never had a, a pension but saved up for the IRA, now that IRA is going to be considered a countable asset and it has to be spent down or otherwise divested somehow, whereas the traditional pensions, it is not the case. Um, if your income is below the what is called the minimum monthly maintenance needs allowance, which in Michigan in 2017, the minimum is $2,003 a month. And we've had a number of these, especially with non-working spouses, stay-at-home spouses, where their, their own uh, Social Security is under $1,000 a month. When the, their spouse goes into a nursing home, part of that income can be shuttled over to the well spouse. And then, this is where keep half the assets, okay? Well, the thing is, is that you can keep half the assets so long as the assets aren't more than $240,000. Because that's the maximum that the well spouse can keep of countable assets. So you can keep half the assets, but only up to the $120,900. That's not a lot. Okay, especially at 0.03% that it's earning on the CDs. So um, the minimum is 24,180, but the maximum is 12,900. So, so the the people that we that we do a lot of the planning for are the people who have assets usually under 500,000 of countable assets plus their own. Then some of these planning, so it's not the really wealthy who can. I mean, I've had a number of clients who, who have enough income on their investments that pay the nursing, you know, that they're earning, they're earning uh, you know, unearned income, dividends, and interest more than the nursing home. So they can just, you know, fund, self-fund, you know, the nursing home. But, but for then these are for, for you know, people that are more modest, that haven't had the savings. Um, then we can do some planning. Now, what about after death? After death, Michigan does have a state recovery. The state recovery says anything that goes through probate first goes to the state of Michigan to pay back Medicaid. If it goes through probate. So what do you do? Make sure it doesn't go through probate. Okay? Um, so what do you do? And we've done this for, for houses. You do and transfer on death deed, also called the ladybird deed. You've probably heard of these. You can name anybody as the beneficiary. It's basically a beneficiary designation of real estate. So you can name a charity as a beneficiary on real estate. So the home is then during lifetime is exempt and then would go to their beneficiary or their charity after death caveat with that is that 
they're given no allowances for the expenses during that time that they're in the nursing home. So the charity or the family are going to have to pony up for taxes, insurance, and like. Um, so, um, joint, yes? So what if the home is in the spouse's name only who is not in the uh, nursing home? Question is, what happens if there's a spouse <coughs> that owns a home? Um, then we don't have to worry about this sort of scenario because what we what ends up happening is that it will not go through probate. It's in the spouse's name, and after the first year, that spouse is a separate asset group. The home is no longer in the nursing home um, spouse's name. In fact, we, that is actually a planning tool where they were planning on selling the house. If we have the proper language and powers of attorney, we then what we do is we transfer the, the home to the well spouse. After the first year, there's separate asset groups. We can sell the house, have the cash to make donations or do whatever. Whereas if it was kept in the nursing home spouse's name and they sold it, half the proceeds would now be a countable asset disqualified for Medicaid have to be spent down. So that's another tool we use. Okay. Oh, I have protected my assets by purchase, purchasing a Medicaid-friendly annuity. Beware of these, okay? What Medicaid-friendly annuity means is that you can convert it to a Medicaid qualifying annuity upon nursing home admission. But what that ends up doing is, yeah, they can qualify for Medicaid, but that annuity now is considered an income stream that goes straight to the nursing home. So pre-planning with these is not the case. There are Medicaid compliant annuities that we use, but only after a nursing home admission. Yes? Yes, the income stream is. Yes, because that's... Pardon? The income that's coming to the donor is, is their income, and that's going to go straight to the nursing home. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yes? Well, then it's her asset and her income, so we'd have to look at that. I well, that then it would be then that's an income stream to her. That would be her income, so or his income. So that would be their income, not his. Joint a joint annuity. Then there are rules on joint ones where they split them half and half. So um, you have to look at each one and see what, see what the contract says, see whether it would be included or not. Um, but for pre-planning, and the, the other thing is, is that if that was done within the last 60 months, the remainder, whatever that present value of that remainder at the time, whatever the charitable contribution was, is going to be considered a divestment. Really? If it's done within 60 months prior to the Medicaid application. So, but there are ways around it. They have rules. Okay, so, who would be, yes? It seems like a pre-planning period here is five years before entering into the assisted living facility. Well, the thing is, is that you can still plan when they go into the nursing home if they have the proper documents in place. Part of the proper, part part of the pre-planning is making sure you have proper financial and healthcare powers of attorney and a will. 
The, pro the financial powers of attorney have to have, I'm getting kind of a little ahead of myself, have to have a very broad power of gifting to allow the power of attorney holder to make basically unlimited gifts. Very, very broad. And then you can make a gift today, immediately qualify for Medicaid tomorrow, create a divestment penalty, and still give substantial gifts. Well, the thing is, well, the thing is, is that if you want to give things away, and I've had clients that were willing to do this, give things away, give everything away, or give a substantial gift, and then hope they don't go in a nursing home for five years. If you have a crystal ball, then <laughs> the problem is, is that we've had situations where the you know, the person who they thought were going into the nursing home doesn't, and then the other one does, or vice versa. Trying to do the pre-planning, I mean, it's, it's like the lifetime lotto. I mean, you're trying to figure out what, you know, what are you gonna, who's gonna die first, who's gonna go in the nursing home first. You know, what we do is we put the instructions in place so you can put and do the planning, and, and most of the planning we do is we do the planning and put the instructions in their plan ahead of time so that it gives them the greatest amount of options if they go into a nursing home. Yes? Is the trigger date the day you go into the nursing home or the day you apply for that? The, uh, basically, the, 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 there's a couple of different dates, but the, the date when you apply for Medicaid as long as you apply before the end of a month, it's retroactive to the first of the month. Okay? And so you just make sure that when you make the application that the assets are where they need to be. So you could be in a nursing home for, you know, like for years and then apply for Medicaid later. But it's, it's always retroactive to the first of the month of the month you apply. Yes. Well, it's actually not the application date, it's the approval date, which is the first of the month. So they will take the first of the month, look back, five years. It's not five years when you apply, so if you apply on the 28th or the 30th, it's the first of that month, they go back five years. Okay. Um, the thing is, is that um, uh, the, the Medicaid compliant annuities, which we do use once they are in the nursing home and we want to protect assets, we do use Medicaid compliant um, annuities. They have to be commercially issued, irrevocable, purchased uh, by the Medicaid applicant or the spouse. They're actuarially sound. They have to be immediate. We used to have all kinds of other different types like annual annuities that we could do and a few others. but. Pretty much these are, there's only less than half a dozen uh, uh, companies in, in the U.S. that will do short-term annuities. Like we've done three-month annuities, you know, five-month annuities in order to create some of these, uh, some of these uh, uh, qualifications. Um, and the one thing that people don't realize is you have to name the state as the beneficiary. So if Medicaid payments have been made, guess where it goes? Yes. So what's the attractiveness You make sure that it's all paid back and out and it's gone before Medicaid starts paying it and you'll see. What that's one of the our examples. So what you do is you create a divestment penalty during this period. This annuity will pay during the penalty period. So the penalty period is done, annuity's gone, before Medicaid even kicks in. So you've got the benefit of it before, before Medicaid even pays its first dollar. That's case study number one. There's a small chance I'll end up in a nursing home. According to a survey in the Journal of New England Medicine, 
Um, basically, one in two people will spend time in a nursing home. One in four will spend more than a year. One in ten will spend more than five years. So, a lot of people say, well, I don't have to worry about that. Well, yeah, you do. <laughs> if Medicaid's going to cover my nursing home expenses, I don't need long-term care insurance. The thing is, is that a lot of times long-term care insurance may make sense to keep people out of the nursing home because most long-term care policies. This is something that, you know, that a lot of people don't think about because then if they're not paying, if they're not going into the nursing home, they have a long-term care policy, they're around longer to make donations. So there's a way that you can provide for them and provide for the charities. Um, not going to go into, we're kind of limited, so um, it's too late to protect my assets if I'm already in a nursing home. Not necessarily, if you have the proper language in your financial powers of attorney, um, it's not too late. You can protect assets, especially with married couples. Um, uh, with single people, we can generally protect about half the assets for married couples. Uh, most all of them, if you have the right language, yes. Uh -huh. When you talk about uh, the durable power of attorney and the mental power of attorney, and that, a lot of couples wanted to um, uh, appoint each other as uh, that person. Is that the right way to go, or is there an ideal candidate to sort of recommend to them for that? That trusted person? The trusted person is who has the skill set. Okay. If the spouse does not have the skill set, then don't appoint the spouse. And I've had clients who did not appoint the spouses as their either their patient advocate or their financial agent. So you choose someone with the skill set and get them involved at the outset so they know their, you know, what their, uh, you know, what their duties are, what the options are. Okay, so if uh, one, like if uh, the husband goes into the nursing home and then the wife takes all of the assets and puts them into her her stuff because she has the power of returning. Everybody's cool with that. That's not something nobody goes, hey, hey. Depends. Okay. Second marriages, blended families, not so much. And we have, I have, you know, that, like I was saying, I have a situation like that right now where that's probably not going to happen. So, um, so, um, one thing is, when people are in, um, when people are uh, applying for Medicaid, they have to be in what is called a Medicaid-approved nursing home, and not all nursing homes um, are eligible for Medicaid. In our county, there's only five in the whole county um, that are Medicaid qualifying, and um, and and one of them is not fully duly Medicare and Medicaid. So we have four that every vet is duly certified Medicaid and Medicare. Well, we have one of them that only has, I think, 65 or 75 beds that are Medicaid, but the rest, but all, all of them are Medicare certified. So in the metro area here, there's a whole lot more options that you have, but, you know, uh, but make sure that the, there's a lot of private pay facilities out there, um, but it has to be Medicaid certified. Um, the, uh, the Medicaid applicant who's ever in the nursing home basically pays a patient pay amount. So they still have to make a payment to the nursing home every month. That's called the patient pay amount, and it's usually their income, less spousal allowances, less any health insurance premiums. And guess what they get to keep? $60 for all of their other incidental expenses. Woohoo! That's <laughs> 60 bucks. That hasn't changed since 1999. It's been 60 bucks. Yeah. So, get their hair done. You know, I mean, yeah. So, what's the spousal allowance? This, the spousal allowances, that was that 2000 to 3000 amount, the minimum monthly maintenance needs allowance. So, if their income is less than that, if the well spouse's income is less than that, they can then take some of the nursing home spouse's income to get them up to those minimum amounts. Okay? Um, and then Michigan uh, Department of Health and Human Services will pay them the difference between the patient pay amount 
and the the um, the nursing home cost. Yes. It's considered an asset, actually. That's why I was saying that the people who have saved in retirement assets, those are not income streams. Those are considered assets, countable assets, that you have to either spend down or we have to pay the tax on them. And for tax purposes, but not for the Department of Health and Human Services purposes. Still considered an asset. For example, you know, if uh, you know up to the hundred and twenty thousand nine hundred that the spouse can keep in their own name, if there's retirement assets in that spouse's name, that's that's the hundred and twenty thousand. So we don't have to pay the taxes on it. So, but everything over the hundred and twenty, cash in, and you know, pay the tax. Um, now the thing is, is that nursing homes generally um, get less for Medicaid because the Medicaid rates are lower than the private pay rates. So. What do they prefer? Private pay rates. So, so that's why they're encouraging spend down your money, pay us, and then, you know, and then go 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 for it. Matt, yes. Yes. What goes into that range? Um, usually, they look at all the household expenses, mortgage, taxes, utilities, and the like. And if it's more than that they can account for more than the two thousand dollars, then they can get up to that three thousand and change. Um, you know, and it's, it's a calculation that they do based upon their actual monthly costs, home insurance, you know, for the spouse. Now, this is the this is the interesting this is this is the planning tool that we use a lot. It's uh, it's uh, let's say in this case this is a single for a single person. For a single person, in fact, we just did this last month for a charity and got about $60,000 to a charity um, using this technique. Um, we just did this one last month. Um, we had a single person with no kids. He had a favorite charity he wanted to. Nursing home said he had $100,000 in assets. He said you have to spend it down to $2,000. So we did this technique, got $60,000 to a same favorite charity. Which in St. Clair County, we have a lot of small little charities with you know under 500,000 annual budgets. So a $60,000 gift to one of those little charities, see, they're around longer to make donations. So there's a way that you can provide for them and provide for the charities. Um, not going to go into. We're kind of limited, so. Um, it's too late to protect my assets if I'm already in a nursing home. Necessarily, if you have the proper language in your financial powers of attorney, um, it's not too late. You can protect assets, especially with married couples. Um, uh, with single people, we can generally protect about half the assets for married couples. Uh, most all of them, if you have the right language, yes. The trusted person is who has the skill set. Okay. If the spouse does not have the skill set, then don't appoint the spouse. And I've had clients who did not appoint the spouses as their either their patient advocate or their financial agent. So you choose someone with the skill set and get them involved at the outset so they know their you know what their uh, you know what their duties are, what the options are. Okay, so if uh, one like if uh, the husband goes into the nursing home and then the wife takes all of the assets and puts them into her her stuff because she has the power of returning, everybody's cool with that. That's not some they're nobody goes, hey, hey. Depends. Okay. Second marriages, blended families, not so much. And we have, I have, you know, that, like I was saying, I have a situation like that right now, where that's probably not going to happen. So, um, so um, one thing is when people are in, um, when people are uh, 
applying for Medicaid, they have to be in what is called a Medicaid-approved nursing home. And not all nursing homes um, are eligible for Medicaid. In our county, there's only five in the whole county um, that are Medicaid qualifying. And, um, and, and one of them is not fully duly Medicare and Medicaid. So we have four that every vet is duly certified Medicaid and Medicare. Well, we have one of them that only has, I think, 65 or 75 beds that are Medicaid, but the rest, but all, all of them are Medicare certified. So in the metro area here, there's a whole lot more options that you have, but, you know, uh, but make sure that the, there's a lot of private pay facilities out there, um, but it has to be Medicaid certified. Um, the, uh, the Medicaid applicant who's ever in the nursing home basically pays a patient pay amount. So they still have to make a payment to the nursing home every month. That's called the patient pay amount, and it's usually their income, less spousal allowances, less any health insurance premiums. And guess what they get to keep? $60 for all of their other incidental expenses. Woohoo! Woo <laughs> 60 bucks. That hasn't changed since 1999. It's been 60 bucks. Yeah. So, get their hair done. You know, I mean, yeah. So, what's the spousal allowance? This the spousal allowances. That was that two thousand to three thousand amount. The minimum monthly maintenance needs allowance. So, if their income is less than that, if the well spouse's income is less than that they can then take some of the nursing home spouse's income to get them up to those minimum amounts. Okay? Um, and then Michigan uh, Department of Health and Human Services will pay them the difference between the patient pay amount and the, the, um, the nursing home cost. Yes? It's considered an asset, actually. That's why I was saying that the people who have saved in retirement assets, those are not income streams, those are considered assets, countable assets, that you have to either spend down or we have to pay the tax on them. And for tax purposes, but not for the Department of Health and Human Services purposes. Still considered an asset. For example, you know, if uh, you know, up to the 120900 that the spouse can keep in their own name. If there's retirement assets in that spouse's name, that's, that's the 120000 So we don't have to pay the taxes on it. So, but everything over the 120, cash in and you know, pay the tax. Um, now the thing is, is that nursing homes generally um, get less for Medicaid because the Medicaid rates are lower than the private pay rates. So what do they prefer? private pay rates. So, so that's why they're encouraging spend down your money, pay us, and then, you know, and then go, go, go for it. Matt, yes? Yes? What goes into that range? Um, usually they look at all the household expenses, mortgage, taxes, utilities, and the like, and if it's more than, that they can account for more than the $2,000, then they can get up to that three thousand and change, um, you know, and it's, it's a calculation that they do based upon their actual monthly costs, home insurance, you know, for the spouse. Now, this is the this is the interesting this is this is the planning tool that we use a lot. It's uh, it's uh, let's say in this case this is a single for a single person, for a single person. In fact, we just did this last month for a charity and got about. $60,000 to a charity um, using this technique. Um, we just did this one last month. Um, we had a single person with no kids. He had a favorite charity he wanted to. Nursing home said he had 100000 in assets. They said you have to spend it down to $2,000. So we did this technique, got $60,000 to a same favorite charity, which in St. Clair County, we have a lot of small little charities with you know, under 500000 annual budgets. So a $60,000 gift to one of those little charities is huge. It's huge. And, that, and, it, and it really worked out well for him. You know, he was able to benefit his favorite charity. Um, in this particular case, um, we had um, 
this is, uh, uh, there's no home in this case, in this particular case study, but the, um, Susan had $160,000 in cash. Her monthly income was $800, but her monthly nursing home cost was $8,000. So if she did no planning or did what she was told or what everybody at the you know, Tim Horton Coffee Clutch told her to do, she's going to spend everything down to $2,000. And it would take her almost two years to spend it down on nursing home care. And then she could qualify for Medicaid after spending it all down, and she only has to pay $740 a month for her nursing home care. Because she got to keep the 60 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> and then, she only saved $2,000. Because that's all she could keep. So what do we do? So, well, what, and this is, and this is, we do this on a regular basis. This is a very common tool for single individuals. We have, um, go out and get a prepaid funeral. Average funeral, typically with a burial, is some, that I have seen is somewhere in the 8,000. If it's a cremation, it's four or five. Um, but we did a prepaid funeral, so the family doesn't have to come up with the money. And this, she could make a substantial gift to her favorite charity. And then another substantial gift to loved ones. Now, the one we did last month, it was 100% to the charity. We had $60,000 that went right to the charity. So it wasn't split between the family and the charity. The one we just did was all to the charity. Then what we did was, that's going to create a divestment. So there's going to be a period of time, because we just made the gift, and it was within the last 60 months, that gift is going to create a penalty period where Medicaid will not cover the nursing home care. So what do we do? We take a piece of the cash, buy a pension, buy a short-term pension. In this particular case, it was a 10-month pension. So during that 10 months, it's going to pay out enough to pay for a private pay nursing home care during the penalty period. So we've created a penalty with the gift. We then take the other half the assets, create an income stream with a Medicaid compliant annuity or promissory note, and then apply for Medicaid. It gets approved. In this case, it was a 10-month penalty. The charity and the, and the family get to keep <laughs> $80,000 in this case. And then Medicaid would start paying out after the 10 months. So after the 10 months, so the first, um, so the first 10 months, she's going to get $7,000 in her pension, that short-term pension, for $800. Then the family has to come up with the $200 to make the $8,000. So during the first 10 months, that's, that's private pay. After 10 months, patient pays 740, she gets to keep her 60 bucks. And then, what have we protected? $88,000 for the family and the charities. Like I said, we did one of these last month where it was 100% the charity, $60,000. Call it half a loaf plan because we're saving about half the assets, half of the loaf are going to be saved for family or their favorite charity. The other half is used to buy the pension, the short-term pension or an income stream to pay the nursing home private pay during the penalty period. So we create a penalty. Yes? I have heard anecdotally that in some nursing homes in some of the larger metropolitan areas that in some of the privately owned, but that's not been my experience. In, in our 
at least in our county, under HIPAA and everything else, you can't tell who is private pay and who's Medicaid. So they could have, you could have a private pay person in, in one half the room and a Medicaid in the other. So in our county, at least, they're the same care and then nobody knows. But the, is it, because I have heard and I've had had people who, there were Medicaid wings in some nursing homes and, and there was a substandard care. I don't know that because I haven't had experience. I just heard stories about that. I don't know. But in our county, all the beds are duly certified except for the one nursing home, Medicare, Medicaid. You don't know who's private pay, who's not. Yes? Yes. Uh, what's the Medicaid rates? It, I, I think it's no. The Medicaid rates uh, are. I think they were. They're like two or three thousand dollars less than the private pay rate. If, in this case, your your Medicaid rate is probably going to be in the four to five thousand dollar range. But at least at last time I checked, I don't know. I mean, if you think about your own health care coverage, if you're on Blue Cross Blue Shield, you lose that, and then you go to Healthy Michigan, where you have fewer providers, and the quality of care or the even the waiting room that you may walk into, it's comparable. Having talked with families who had to make this decision. Not that they shouldn't make this decision, but it brings up the whole ethical part of the conversation and having people be fully informed about what it is they're really deciding for somebody who's got dementia. Yes. And the thing is, is that we make these decisions ahead of time. We talk to our clients.